Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you, and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the Exhibitor Hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills. Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and The Bread Bakers Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live and once again, Welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. And welcome everybody. We are back, we are live and it is here in the United States Labor Day. So many of you were probably at the grill or maybe at the at the beach, who knows where you are, or maybe you're here with us, but uh, welcome. And those of you who are joining us for, uh, through our archives, uh, whatever day you join us, uh, we're about to meet uh, this week's speaker. Uh, our presentation today is by Eric Pallant, who is the Professor of Environmental Science and Sustainability at Allegheny College, but more important, he is the author of Sourdough Culture, a new book that will be out next week. We're going to hear all about it in just a second. A couple of announcements first. Um, let me remind you that, uh, again, we have one more drawing for our, our bread knife at the end of the month. So if you have not yet uh, signed the guest books in all of the uh, uh, sponsor booths, please uh, mosey over there. When you get a chance, go in, sign the books, leave a little note. And if you've uh, signed all 10 of the sponsored uh, welcome books or guest books, you will be eligible for the next spin, which we'll do at the end of September. Uh, next week, we have a couple of speakers, but also this Wednesday, we have um, a, a different than our usual demo Wednesday. We're going to have a presentation by uh, Michael Gleason, who is uh, one of the directors of innovation technology at Puratos, along with Daniel Kurzrock, who is co-founder of Regrained, which uh, produces uh, upcycled uh, grains for, for 
um, let's say, upcycle purposes. And they're going to present uh, a presentation on essentially uh, grains that are good for us and good for the planet. And so again, following along the lines of uh, today's presentation on sustainability from our sustainability professor, uh, we're, they're going to talk, show us exactly how they do it and uh, give us some ideas and strategies for things that are uh, maybe uh, coming to us in the future. And then next Monday, we'll have a panel with Mark Vetri, who is, uh, many of you know him through Iron Chef competitions and uh, his, his James Beard award-winning restaurant, uh, Vetri in Philadelphia, one of the top, uh, not only top restaurants in the country, but really kind of the the, the pinnacle of uh, modern, modern, not modernistic, but modern uh, presented, reinvented Italian cuisine here in uh, the United States. Uh, Mark uh, wrote a book along with uh, his co-authors, Claire Cop McWilliams, who was his baker, and David Joachim, co-author uh, of Mastering Bread. It's part of a series of books that, that Mark and David have done together, and they've added Claire for this one because she's a bread, ma bread master. Uh, and Mastering Bread is uh, continues from where Mastering Pizza left off and Mastering Pasta. And they will talk all about their discoveries working with uh, bolted or uh, high extraction flour as being maybe a key to making extraordinary breads. So we're going to hear about that next week. And then next Wednesday, uh, Patricia Kennedy of uh, WP Kemper will present again. She's, uh, this will be her second time back this year presenting about equipment of the future, this time uh, scaling and dividing equipment that uh, already is out there and things that are still to come. So that's coming up. And then the week after that, we've got Nancy Silverton. We've got Nathan Mirvold coming up. We've got a lot of things uh, on the horizon. So keep coming back. We've got seven more weeks to go uh, and a lot of content to follow. So uh, thank you once again for joining us. And for those who can, we'll continue the conversation later in the after party in the VIP lounge. And with that said, let me introduce uh, Eric Pallant. Uh, Joe, why don't you there you go, Eric's camera's on. Uh, Eric, I'm going to like, kind of let you take it from here. I just want to make sure everybody knows that you are the professor of environmental science and sustainability at Allegheny College in, in uh, Allegheny, Pennsylvania, right? Did you guys get hit by the hurricane last week? Just off the edge. So it was sunny here. The rest of the state drowned. So Yeah, my, my, my family in Philadelphia got hit pretty, pretty hard. Um, but uh, well, well, anyway, welcome back because you presented at the symposium, I think it's symposium number two in right. Charlotte, right? And, uh, and back then the book was in process and you gave us a little sneak preview, but now we are like days away from the actual release of the book. Uh, and, um, uh, and the book is called uh, Sourdough Culture. You wanna hold it up so everyone can see? There's Sourdough Culture, a history of bread making with the science, oh wait, What's that little word there? A history of bread making. From. Oh, ancient to modern, from ancient to modern bakers. Okay. So. The important part is check out who wrote this amazing. Oh, oh yes. It's right. I forgot all about the, you know what? Amazing uh, forward. I, I wrote that quite a while ago and it seems like, right. you know, the, the publishing world is going slower and slower, but uh, yes, thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this book because I really, really enjoyed reading it. Um, it, it was I think, you know, a, a book about sourdough culture, which is essentially the history of sourdough making, could be either very dry <laughs> or it can be very, very fermented and bubbly. And I yeah. think that uh, you presented it in such an engaging and entertaining way that it held my attention from first page to last. Uh, even if I hadn't been a bread geek already, you know, I think I, it, the story worked. You were, it was a story well told. So uh, congratulations thank on that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I, I have to say thank you, especially to you, um, not just for the forward to the book, but uh, I, don't, I don't believe I would have been here had I not had your support and your encouragement and the gentle nudge to join the Bread Bakers Guild of America and to come to the conference where I met so many wonderful people, you know, Aaron McKinney and Stanley Ginsberg and Dave Joachim and uh, Carl DeSmet. I mean, just all of my heroes, right, in one place. And uh, they really gave me the encouragement and, and uh, support to, to keep moving. So uh, I'm so glad. Thank you. I'm so glad. And I know that uh, the, 
the journey of writing a book and getting a book published is more arduous than it is making sourdough bread. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and again, and then you add, you throw the COVID into the mix and the delays in publishing and printing and everything else. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit before you, before you give us a taste of what the, what's in the book, a little bit of the, of, of sort of how you came to write it and, uh, and what you went through to finally get it published. Uh, so, so, uh, in, until you're like a, f a famous cookbook writer, like uh, say Peter Reinhardt, uh, it, it, it seems that the, the, the trick to publishing is you absolutely have to have an agent. And to have an agent, you have to have published a book. <laughs> and and uh, 22. <laughs> it really is. I spent a, a long time learning that. It was a very steep learning curve. And that's when I realized I need to meet the, the people who write these books and who have agents and who are just really good at it and learn from them. And uh, coming to your to the second conference was what opened that door for me. Um, it, it, it brought me to an agent who then brought me to a couple of uh, potential publishers and and uh, I was off and running and then COVID hit and everything stopped. I, I'm not quite sure I understand why publishers stopped publishing during COVID. Uh, it seemed like there was nothing else to do but read books. But um, and, and little did we know that everybody on the planet was going to take up sourdough baking, you know, yeah. a month after COVID hit. Um, I, I, I imagine there are a lot of uh, science projects in the backs of people's refrigerators right now. Right. Uh, <laughs> people are not still baking. But um, and then, you know, I'm finally getting ready to, to publish this book and there are shortages of paper because and shortages of lumber, you know, like all this stuff that you don't think about. But I think but, that's what really uh, Paul would stop the publishing industry is that that you could have a book waiting in line to be printed and there's no paper and there's nobody to run the presses. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. So um, but it's coming together and uh, the official book launch is uh, September 14th. But I'm, I'm hearing from some people that. Uh, they're getting their books in the mail already. So I, I don't exactly know, know how that works, uh, but you know you can go online now and order it and it will show up in the next week or two. And you can go any place and order the book. It again is called Sourdough Culture, Eric Pallant, forward by Peter Reinhardt. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get probably, uh, whether it's Amazon or any other online uh, group, or if you have a favorite local bookstore, you know, right. uh, have them order it for you. And then uh, uh, we can support the local. The local booksellers as well. Uh, now, it's Allegheny, uh, are, are you at one of these publisher parish universities where, where no, you were for no, getting no, published? not at all. So that, it, it's the great wonder of a small college like mine where, um, you know, I really teach about, you know, all these miserable, miserable things in the world, you know, climate change and ocean pollution and all that. And I can write a book about sourdough and they're they're happy with that. So it's well looking. And whether they reward you or not at the school, that you can be sure that they're very proud and happy to right. be able to get bragging rights that one of their own is uh, is is published uh, a new book. And exactly. So exactly. congratulations on that. And Thank uh, you. okay, so so I'm going to step back here a little bit. In fact, I'm going to uh, in a second I'm going to mute my camera and let you sort of uh, uh, give us a little taste of what the book's about. So it's all yours. The floor is yours. All right. So thank you. So what I what I thought I would do is read like the first three pages of the book, which is the introduction. And, and it's an explanation of how I came to write this book. And I can't think of a way to do this on camera without just sort of looking down and you can look at the top of my head. Um, and and that'll just give us a, a a beginning taste, as as Peter says, about how the book is written and and um, anybody who has a partner will recognize the understatement of the very first sentence of the book, which says, if it weren't for the gentle persistence of my wife, and I'll let you interpret what that means, gentle persistence of my wife, I would avoid most social gatherings. I would have found an excuse not to attend a picnic hosted by Malosh Mamula, Director of Financial Aid at Allegheny College and his wife, Quinby, and I would have missed my opportunity to begin a relationship with a sourdough starter that has now stretched more than 30 years. I was a new assistant professor of environmental science at Allegheny College, and the Mamulas had invited us to a get to know the new couple summer picnic in their backyard. It was 1988. 
In the countryside outside Meadville, Pennsylvania, the sun was bright, the sky was cloudless, and their lawn expanded like an endless ocean of green. There were hardwood forests in the valleys. Susan and I arrived at the Mamulas as we often do when approaching gatherings. Susan was smiling and looking forward to an afternoon conversing with people, and I was in quite the opposite state. My heart was beating too quickly, my hands were leaving damp marks on the steering wheel, and my appetite had been displaced by mild nausea. I do not recall what we had for lunch, but I do remember enjoying the bread that was served and using that to break my discomfiture. The bread had oatmeal in it, so in addition to its home-baked warmth, and golden crust, there was an overture of comfort about it. Hey, this is great bread, I said, or something equally witty. It's sourdough bread. I just baked it, Quimby said. Oh, I bake bread, but I've never used sourdough, I told her. Would you like some of my starter? I can give you some now. Come on in, I have some growing in the kitchen. Though none of us knew it at the time, the bread we ate with lunch was baked from a sourdough starter that I would later find out was nearing its 100th birthday and had a history I would trace back as far as the gold rush in Cripple Creek, Colorado in 1893. It was also the beginning of my love affair with sourdough. I took the Mamula starter more on an impulse than because of any particular ideological commitment or cooking goal. When I was young, my dad made bread. He was a big man, over six feet tall, more than 200 pounds. His hands were the size of catcher's mitts. He made eggy brioche with noses that protruded like his and shiny tops like his own bald head. I liked brioche because it was sweet and rich. He made sourdough too, but because of its overwhelming dissimilarity to the wonder bread I had grown up with and preferred, I did not take to it at the time. There was something magical about Quimby Mamula's bread that infused me with a spirit to learn how to work with sourdough. I looked at a few recipes, but mostly experimented, making a thousand mistakes and accumulating just as many observations. As the first decade of the 2000s neared its end, one day I pulled my sourdough culture from the refrigerator, pausing just before feeding it fresh water and flour. Staring into my bottle of culture, I thought to myself, that my Cripple Creek starter had been with me longer than my children, both of whom were then teenagers capable of consuming large quantities of bread. It had outlived multiple computers, numerous cell phones, a toaster, a refrigerator, and a washing machine. It was one of my oldest possessions. And unlike the few things that I had inherited from my grandparents, my sourdough starter was a living heirloom. If I had kept this starter alive for 20 years, and it was alive in the Mamulo household before coming to me. How old was it? My need to know more was greater than my fear of cold calling the Mamulas. After our picnic, we had not stayed in touch and Malosh had since retired from Alabama. To my great relief, within seconds of answering the phone, they recalled our long ago luncheon and who, even who gave them the starter. It had belonged to Douglas Steeples, a friend of theirs from when they lived in Indiana in the 1970s. Steeples had inherited it from his grandmother. Already, I understood our starter to be very old. Finding Douglas Steeples and asking what he could recall was my next step. At one time, Steeples had been a professor of history at Earlham College. He'd retired, was well into his 70s and living in North Carolina when I first reached him. Just as the Mamulas had requested a sample of starter when I called them out of the blue, Steeples asked if he could have a sample returned to him. Both had let their starters die some 10 years prior. I packed a jar full into a FedEx box with some ice packs and sent it on its way. About the starter, Steeples could say only one thing with assurance. It didn't originate with his grandmother. He was confident the starter he gave to the Mamulas was from the Cripple Creek Gold Rush of 1893. Steeples was not exactly sure how the starter had gotten to him. For more than a year, he and I corresponded as he fed me clues. I was now the owner of a Gold Rush starter from 1893, a starter with a proud history. After a little research, I learned sourdough and gold mining were more than metaphorically synonymous. 
Legend states that gray-bearded, bandy-legged miners protected personal starters at gunpoint. When it got cold at night, they slept with pouches of starter inside their bedclothes to keep their starters from freezing. According to some accounts, living with a sourdough starter next to their skin meant that some miners began to smell like it. No one has ever written much about what a sourdough starter smelled like after cozying up to an unbathed miner night after night. By 1898, at the height of the Klondike gold rush in Alaska, a miner coming in from the wild for provisions not only smelled like sourdough, but was also called a sourdough. For many years, any loaf of bread I baked was served with a story about a lonely miner in the Rocky Mountains who had once baked with the same sourdough starter I was now using. Remarkably, it seemed my starter had survived for more than 125 years and had apparently escaped the most common demises. It had not been accidentally baked, contaminated, infected, or ignored. Was it possible to discover the origins of my miner's starter? Had my miner arrived in the West with a pouch of starter from his mother's kitchen? Maybe it was even a starter that had been in his family since before they'd arrived in North America from somewhere in Europe. My imagination ran wild, but the seeds of a book, this book, were beginning to germinate. I had studied microbiology as a PhD student and knew I needed to broaden my inquiry. Was there any way to know if the bacteria and yeast now living in my refrigerator were descendants of microscopic organisms from more than a century prior? Did it matter if they were? For the better part of a year, Douglas Steeples tried to recall who exactly had given him the starter. He sent me names of former colleagues and students and I did my best to locate them to ask if they were once sourdough bakers. While I followed Steeples leads, I recognized that my investigation would eventually grow cold. Sooner or later, I would reach a point in history that no one who was still around could remember. In order to deduce how a starter might have first arrived in Cripple Creek, Colorado, I began searching for the origin of bread. My plan was to work forward from that history in the hope that at some point, my investigation would intersect with the history of my starter. Beginning with the first known bread bakers, I would trace sourdough through millennia until I found at least one viable route that led to Cripple Creek, Colorado. I wanted to learn who invented bread and who invented sourdough. How did bread come to be the stable upon which so much of Western civilization came to depend? What experiments led scientists to reveal that living species were growing and reproducing inside a sourdough starter? Did gold miners really sleep with sourdough starters inside their clothes? What happened when they rolled over? And why, after 6,000 years, have so many people given up on sourdough in favor of bread designed by engineers to exit a factory line with all the reliability and taste of a Model T? My attempt, my attempt to answer these questions is this book. The paradox of a sourdough starter is that while each cell responsible for raising a loaf of bread is but a few hours old when it is cooked, the ability of people to harness the microbial power of yeast and bacteria to leaven is as old as civilization itself. I wanted to know who first domesticated the microscopic organisms now slumbering in my refrigerator to reveal the life of my starter had lived and in effect to learn the culture of my culture. The birth of my sourdough culture, it turns out, was intertwined with the birth of agriculture and Earth's first civilizations. Okay, if you are not asleep, you can wake up and come back and ask me questions. I'm not asleep and uh, we'll throw the floor open to any of you who are out there watching who would like to uh, raise some questions, go ahead and, and type them into the uh, Q&A uh, or to the chat. The Q&A would probably be the best and uh, we'll just throw them to Eric. And in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, uh, I'm thinking that, you know, how we, we think of a sourdough 
uh, even when you're making a sourdough starter from from scratch and you haven't been given one from somebody, you start by a little process of adding flour and water together and, and you create what we call the seed culture. And right. in a sense, and the seed culture is really just the sort of the early stages of, of, of what is a seed culture, which is the starter. Um, and so this seed, that the seed culture that, uh, that, that Quimby Mamula gave you, it really was a seed for something that uh, amazing how long it took to germinate to turn into a book, <laughs> but, but amazingly how it kind of the, the staying power of that seed to uh, ultimately sort of uh, become uh, the, the story and the history of, of bread itself. Uh, so clearly, you know, you 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 threw out in the in the intro there your uh, your 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 quest and your your objectives for the book, and without without kind of uh, you know spoiling it for everybody because we want you all to read this. Um, what were some of the what were some of the unexpected discoveries that you kind of ran across along the way as the seed took hold? As the seed took hold. Um... Well, just that, uh, well, bread is what we've all depended upon, right? Since, since the, the, the first person in discovered or invented bread uh, in the Fertile Crescent and, and that so many, so much of our history in the West, right? Of course, in the East, it's rice and in the Americas, it's potatoes and maize and so forth. But, but Western civilization is about the, the um, coexistence of, of wheat and microbes and people such that uh, none of us can really survive without the other, right? So that, so that uh, wheat as we know it now and rye and oats and so forth, uh, if left in a wild field by themselves, would uh, simply be beat out by weeds, and we as humans keep them alive. And in exchange, uh, they keep us alive. And and so that is a, a thread that I wanted to follow from the from the very beginning. Is is uh, who who's doing that work? Like who who's keeping us all alive and and making making these breads and and making. All of us have enough calories to survive and work and uh, put in another day's effort uh, is, is something that starts in the Fertile Crescent uh, six, eight thousand years ago and continues really until about a hundred years ago when uh, industry sort of mechanizes, uh, uh, well, most of life, right? Well, um, uh, Sung Lee just wrote in and wants to know, he said, thank you for the reading. I'm wondering whether you have found the origin of the microorganisms in your starter and what came first, bread or beer? <laughs> that's, the, that's the eternal bread geeks question. <laughs> it is the eternal bread or, geeks question. Or the, or the beer geeks question even. And I have no intention of trying to answer that. Um, the, 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 I have had the, the actual microscopic organisms, the yeast and bacteria in my starter um, analyzed and, and they're nothing special, right? I was really hoping like I had some rare, rare, unusual species of yeast and bacteria you could find only at the top of the Rocky Mountains or, 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 or some, but there are Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Lactobacillus, just like everybody else's. Um, so, so they do taste different. So there are other, there are other guys in there. Um, and I have three or four different starters and they all taste different and behave differently and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, you know, a large part of this book is, is, is the investigation of like, how much does it matter that the starter here is a hundred plus years old? Um, or could you make one this week and uh, in two weeks be making bread that's just as good? Like, is there something about the terroirs or something about uh, age, like, like we expect with wines, that, that there's a kind of cultivation here that uh, really matters? And um, you'll have to read the book to find out what the answer that I can. <laughs> well, um... Just backtracking a little, we've got some other questions coming in here and uh, we'll, we'll get to them. But um, uh, first of all, of course, I'll never be able to listen to Creedence Clearwater Revival again now in, a, in the same way, right? Because uh, right. uh, there's something just just magical about that name, Cripple Creek, 
start is where's where's Cripple Creek, and uh, and and I never heard about the Cripple Creek Gold Rush. So let's start at let's your start. sort of point of entry. Yeah, that's a great point of entry. So that may be my biggest surprise. Um, is so Cripple Creek is uh, a, a, a gold rush on the backside of Pikes Peak in Colorado. Oh, and it was in its time the largest uh, um, gold rush in in the history of the United States, and and to this day, it's still being actively mined by a South African conglomerate. Really? Uh, that has taken off the top of a mountain and is still extracting. So larger even than the California gold rush or the Alaskan gold rush? Larger than both of them. Wow. And um, more interesting than that was the that almost everything I had heard and learned about gold miners and this business of holding this special pouch turned out not to be true. Mm. It's just not true. And, and it... it, it it takes a little bit of explaining to, to why it, in some ways it can't be true. Um, first off, how many men of the 1840s to 1890s knew how to cook anything, <laughs> right? So even if they had their mother's starter, like what were they going to do with it? And then what happens is you have thousands of people showing up in, in Colorado to do placer mining. And then, I mean, in San Francisco to do placer mining, which is with the pans that you, you know, sort of the old fashioned thing, but they were living, um, it turns out both in San Francisco and in Alaska and in Colorado in uh, hotels ah. and in, in lodging and the mines themselves in all of those places, not so much in California, but after that were owned by wealthy, wealthy uh, businessmen. This is the gilded age, you know, the, when railroad barons and, and coal barons and steel barons owned the, the means of production, and they paid miners three dollars a day to go work in the mines. And the uh, they took that three dollars a day, and rather than living in some magical wild west, they paid somebody to bake their bread, and they paid somebody to wash their clothes, and they paid somebody for lodging. Um, and it turns out that Cripple Creek, Colorado became when $3 a day for a 10 hour, for an eight hour day, the mine owners tried to stretch it to a 10 hour day. Uh -huh. There was a strike, a huge miner strike that became the most famous and violent strike in the history of the U.S., where the U.S. had to send Army National Guard to separate miners and self-made militias. There were three armies at war, 12,000 feet above sea level. Were the, were the militias funded by the, by the uh, gold barons, by the, 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 the billionaires, so to speak? Exactly. Wow. Right. Wow. So the billionaires paid guys to, to pick up guns and shoot at miners. The miners blew up the mines. Uh, the National Guard came to try and separate them. It took about three months to sort of settle the war. Uh, and, and this whole time, you also have women and kids and families living there. And there were bakeries, lots of bakeries. Uh -huh. Even in San Francisco, the money to be made was not in panning for gold. And this, uh, it was made selling stuff to miners. Like you need a pair of dungarees. Here's Levi and Strauss to sell you a pair of dungarees. Right, the provision providers. <laughs> Exactly. You've got thousands and thousands of people there. They are not living in little tents by themselves with their little frying pans and all that. That turned out was invented um, by a, a, a poet and an author after the Klondike cold rush as fiction, but it lived on as an American myth. Now that is fascinating because I don't think too many of us knew that. Right. And, uh, and, and so I'm thinking, so, the, so in Cripple Creek, the sourdough that that traces its origins to to the one that you were using, which probably was then older than that one, even um, uh, was the, that was made in, in bakeries, not by by uh, miners out there in the fields. Uh, not, even, so. not even not even like sourdough pancakes over the over an open fire. <laughs> Don't we all have that image, right? Yes. We all have that image. I know. And there was probably one guy who did that. Yeah. Someplace, someplace in Alaska. And if he was smart, he wrote a book about it. <laughs> exactly. Um, who's the author who wrote Call of the Wild? Uh, Jack London. 
Jack London is the guy who did it. He made $100,000 selling books about these mythical Alaskan gold miners. Yes, he romanticized the, that hard life. But, like that. Uh, Which if you work with, you, you with his head instead of his hands. <laughs> exactly. And imagine how appealing that was if you're now some poor working schmo in Philadelphia where it's 105 degrees and you're working in some office or some factory and somebody's writing a book about the call of the wild in Alaska, you'd, you'd at least pay five cents for the book. That's right. You could vicariously live the uh, the romantic gold rush life. Exactly. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so Cripple Creek, is uh, that's like somewhere around, I mean, Pikes Peak is somewhere around uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, as exactly. A, so that yeah, area yeah. now is... Is it still is the, this this conglomerate that now owns the mining rights? Are they still pulling gold out of those hills? They are still pulling gold out of those hills um, with 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 machinery and vehicles that are as big as buildings. You know, the, the, I, I was up there and the the truck rolling past the tires on just the trucks rolling past are two stories high. I mean, it's just uh, uh, astonishing. But Cripple Creek itself now is a um, a casino town. Uh. Is there anybody in Cripple Creek itself making sourdough bread that you know of? Uh, so I did find there is one baker who, <laughs> right? So I went to Cripple Creek and said, okay, does anybody remember? Does yeah. anybody remember? And and uh, the, the, the woman in the bakery understood exactly why I was asking. <laughs> she knew exactly why I'd want to know. And she had just immigrated from Germany three years before I got there. And that was the only baker in town. Well, you know, they, everybody else is in the casinos and eating junk food that they're yeah, serving. Yeah. You know, so. Well, at least there was that one one seed keeping it alive. And yeah. Who knows what could grow out of it? Yeah. Some, somebody kept it alive from 1893 to 1970. I can't imagine who or how. I can guess. And somebody brought at least the technique to Cripple Creek. My, yes. my, my guess is, and this is really fascinating. I didn't know this either that you know perhaps somebody who's uh, the offspring of a San Francisco bakery right mm -hmm. so you have a you have a anybody who is smart went to the gold rush of 1849 in San Francisco to sell things to miners not to actually try to mine things because you weren't right. going to get rich mining things and there were like there were dozens and dozens of bakeries and several of which were French in origin and the French were uh, were and still are famous for their sourdough. And, and among the first to get there, there's some evidence, and I didn't know this, there were large colonies of Frenchmen in Mexico. I always thought Mexico was like Spanish everything. But in the 1840s, there were large colonies of, Span uh, of Frenchmen who made their way from these French colonies to San Francisco to sell French breads to miners. Interesting. Well, wasn't Napoleon the third or whatever the emperor of Mexico? So right. Must, so right. Must have been a French takeover at some point. Exactly for a very short period of time. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, and 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 yes, and having lived in the Bay Area, I remember there there are you know the bakeries there called the the well Franco American and uh, uh, Boudin's Boudin's. 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 Yeah, is the, is the most famous, and and they have a starter from eighteen forty nine. Um, which they are very, very proud of. And as I'm sure you know, they're very insistent, can only be grown in San Francisco, is so unique to San Francisco. And that one turns out, I can tell you right now, it's not true, but it is a brilliant mar marketing technique. Yeah, cue the marketing department. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there's a lot, so there's a lot of a lot to unpack in this story of this unfolding story of sourdough, which includes, you know, the marketing of sourdough and the marketing of the legend and the romance and everything behind it. Uh, here, um, Marianne wants to know, thank you for presenting a fascinating presentation and for sharing your passion for bread and sourdough. I note in the online description of your book, and thank you, by the way, Marianne, for looking that up, um, that you provide recipes in the book. What Correct. are your favorites and what flour or flowers do you like to use for feeding the sourdough? Any tips? So the recipes, essentially, the, 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 the book is is broken up into eight historical eras, uh, you know, a, a, a period from 10,000 years ago to maybe 3,000 years ago, followed by the ancient Egyptians and then the ancient Romans and then the medieval period and so forth. And so I've, I've, I've done my best to 
uh, include sample recipes from each period. So if you wanted to make bread like an ancient Egyptian, this is the, the, the best we can ascertain based on Egyptian Instagram photos, what the, what the recipes were. Um, I, I, it's not, the, the, the book is, is, is not meant really to be used as a cookbook. And, you know, it's used to, 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 to for the fun. Recipes are like, they illustrate the eras and the, and the, the thought that was prevailing in those times. Exactly. But, but what about yourself? So the, the, you've obviously you've exposed yourself to a lot of knowledge, history and a methodology. So are, are there any things that kind of, uh, became part of your, method? So I, I have three different starters that are my go-to starters. Um, I, I have the Cripple Creek starter, which, uh, which I, I, I converted to whole wheat right after I got it from the manulas and have used as a whole, I feed it whole wheat. Oh, uh -huh. um, and it is the most acidic of my starters. It is the sourest of my starters. It doesn't have the most oomph of my starters, but it is going to give you a sourdough bread. I have another one that, uh, that my wife actually started from um, grapes, grapes not far from my house here in Meadville, Pennsylvania. And that's my white starter. It's got a lot of lift, a lot of, um, uh, boy, it just makes wonderful breads. And then I have a, a starter and it, it's described in the book um, that comes from a, a, a Russian rye bread factory from 1960 that I, uh, <clears throat> I exchanged some Cripple Creek for uh, with Andrew Whitley in Scotland, uh -huh. who had this one from, from the Russian factory. And the story behind it is amazing. First of all, the, the rye is, is just incredible. And, and I'm sure you know anybody who uses a rye starter, it's just, it's a different animal entirely. Yeah. But, but in 1960, um, we were at the height of the Cold War and the arms race and, 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 and all of this. And, and the, um, there was a real division in how, how we approach bread. So 1960 is the beginning in, the, in, in England and North America of the Chorley Wood bread process, right? We're going to mechanize bread and, and, and convert dough to fit these very large machines, Right, so we're going to put in elasticizers and extenders, and we're going to put in uh, uh, preservatives, and we're going to we're going to cool these things down while we run them through uh, essentially a no time yeast process. We're going to add a ton of yeast and add molasses to feed the yeast and so forth. But we we actually change the bread to fit the machines at the same time. The rye starter I got, uh, which I feed, of course, only rye, um, with uh, that I make. I mill myself with my mock mill. Uh, nice. oh. um, that the Russians had a factory which turned out a million and a half loaves every day because the Soviet authority said, this is what you will produce, a million and a half loaves every day. Wow. And they did it by having like scores of little tiny bakeries with people working in them, making one loaf at a time and putting them on conveyor belts. Wow. And so what they did is they converted the factory to fit the people rather than the bread to fit. It turns out a half million loaves came back every day because they didn't really, the whole Soviet economy was, didn't work. So people couldn't buy it. They couldn't afford it. They didn't need it or whatever. It just, there was not a match between supply and demand. Wow. And what would you do in that case, Peter? You boiled up the old sourdough from yesterday. Yeah. You turned it into a mash and put it into tomorrow's bread. So it just kept getting repurposed. Right. Which feeds into next week's presentation on upcycling. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. Interesting. Well, so that, so that, is that kind of the origin of that, of that technique of using uh, 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 old bread in your new bread? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the origin, but it is a very uh, sort of Eastern European rye bread approach to uh, making bread. And it's fantastic. It and Harry Paymuller actually demonstrated that a few weeks ago in his I demo. Saw that. Right. I, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. And and it's great. if you ever get a chance, try it. It's, it really is shockingly good. So, so that's a, a back to you, Mary. And that that's one bread that you may want to uh, try from the from the book when you get your book, which you've looked up. Uh, and uh, 
if, if you like rye bread, then that's something worth trying. And the recipe for that is in the book, right? Your, your, uh, your method for how to make that bread? Not that one, but I'll send it to her if she wants. She can email me. Okay, so uh, for those who would, would like to, you can get uh, you can you can get uh, you know each other's. You can share each other's email addresses through our. That's right. It's all in your uh, in the conference room. Yeah, yeah, on the on the dashboard. Right. So uh, and Eric, you can write directly to Eric and get get the recipes from him. And then uh, if there's anything else that you have on file that you would like us to post in the in the oh, recipe okay. folder, if you could send that to uh, me and Gurmi. We'll get it posted in there for folks to. All right, let me think about it. We won't have to keep uh, bugging you for it. Um, although we kind of like, I think all of us, especially if you've written a book, you like hearing from people who are interested yeah. in what you wrote about. So <laughs> somebody, some people beside my mother, right? Have you and now you're at Allegheny College? Is it university co or college? Is it, what a small it? college, two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah. It's about the same size as Johnson and Wales. Are yeah. you um, at least my campus? Um, you're already back in session then with your students. You're you're up and running. And uh, how much time uh, before we get back to the bread? How much time, you know, uh, during a, a week are you are you engaged in actually teaching? And is it hands on, you know, uh, face to face this year? Or are you back? Yeah, to yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly, uh, face to mask. I'm looking for my mask. Face uh, to mask. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we're back in person, which is wonderful. It makes all the difference. So you're in, in the classroom pretty much every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do have a day job. That's. Uh, <laughs> Well, they tell any, any uh, aspiring writer, they always say, do not give up your day jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So that, so we've got the Marianne. So now, Jean uh, asked, do you touch on issues around high altitude baking in your book? I imagine uh, that altitude was an issue for baking on a mountain in Colorado. Yeah, you're right. No, I don't. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I have relatives in Colorado and they're always talking to me about it. My daughter, who's a very good baker, um, and a couple of other people have taken this Cripple Creek starter back to Colorado to bake with. And what they find is uh, what we consider here at sea level to be sort of a nice rise without that air pressure becomes a big rise very quick. It really takes off. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so when you were in Cripple Creek and you were kind of trying to track down that that story, did you meet and you met? Was that when you met the baker, the German woman who was the baker? Yeah. And so did you talk bread baking with her? Did she share any any techniques? And, and I mean, you went to a lot of places to do research. So right. you, did that include being able to kind of pick bakers' brains a little bit on? I did, and and she was you know she she was not the um, we didn't not as much as as. Um, so I was I was focused on like who had my starter, not how do you make great bread. Yeah, uh, yeah. But but I have you know since like talked to 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 great bakers all over the world and and have asked every one of them the question of like does the starter matter? You know how important is the starter? And I will tell you this, and then ask you a question. I think to a person, every one of them has said, "Yeah, doesn't really matter. It, it, it it's it's the." It's the, the experience of the baker. It's the quality of the ingredients. It's the amount of time and attention that really, yes, starter matters, but having really good quality flour, having it freshly milled, those are the things that make for, for really great bread. And what, what, what I'm curious about, uh, I'll ask you, Peter, it, it, certainly that's true, but, but are, are all of these great, Bakers also saying, "Yeah, the starter is not important." Like they're saying, "No, I'm not going to give you my recipe." It, it, <laughs> I, it, I, you know what? I don't think so. I think that what they're saying, and what I think they might be saying, and uh, you know, I can't read their minds, but is that they're basically saying the starter works. If you have a right. starter that works, use it. That's not the that's not the issue here. But but I think that what you might have an insight on that they might not, especially if they're been locked into making bread where they are for a long period of time, is is do you notice a difference in flavors as a result of different starters? Can you tell the difference? Between Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think anybody who's a, a, an experienced uh, sourdough bread maker uh, can, can tell, they get to know their starters. And, and I, one of the stories in the book I tell us, I, I have a, a, a colleague and a, and a friend to whom I gave this Cripple Creek starter who then she went on and married a... Um, a Mexican diplomat 
So every every three years, she gets moved to another country and another continent. Wow. And so the question is like, when, and I caught up with her in China after she had been in Mexico and Ecuador. And I went to China and I said, okay, let's make, let's make Cripple Creek sourdough bread and see if it's been 10 years since they've been separated from mine. Can we tell the difference? And there was no question about it. It was exactly the same. That three continents, 10 years apart, her starter, my starter made breads that were recognizably the same. Recognizably what? The same. The same. The same. The same. Yeah, they yeah. were the same bread. Yeah. I, I noticed years ago when I first like I threw myself into sourdough, because like a lot of bakers, I started out as a yeast baker and right. uh, you know, really and it was focused on that because even though I lived in the Bay Area. There was so much sourdough that I thought I got to go a different direction. So I was working on a different track. But then, of course, like everybody else, you get you get sucked into the sourdough to sourdough culture, and you just you just can't pull yourself out because it's 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 fathomless. And right. and so back then, the popular book was uh, Dr. Ed Wood's book on uh, sourdoughs from antiquities, in which he went around and collected starters and powdered them up and made them available. And so right. I bought. I think I got myself maybe four of his starters and I started a parallel experiment. Uh, and I definitely could tell that I made the exact same recipe with each of those starters. And right. for about, I would say three to four weeks, there was very clear delineation between each of the loaves. And then of course, being San Francisco where there is such a strong, you know, predominance of, you know, of, of the, the, the home teams, the organisms, uh, they all started to migrate. Now, they, they had promised in, in their marketing that it will it will retain its integrity and not change, but they all did. And maybe that wouldn't be true somewhere else than San Francisco, but they all, by the by about two months into it, then they all were San Francisco sourdough starters. <laughs> and, and you know who the real experts on this are, are Aaron McKinney yeah. and, and Rob Dunn. I mean, yeah. you, nobody knows more than they do, I think, about the, the evolution and the transformation of 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 sourdough cultures in that regard. The so if you're watching this presentation today, uh, uh, both Aaron and Rob did previously present a few weeks, uh, a couple months ago uh, right. about this very topic. So go back to the archives if you missed their presentation and, and, and see what they had to say about that. But certainly Aaron has been tracking starters from all over the world. Yeah. And Rob is on the yeast side. He's really focused in his presentation on the yeast side. So uh, I think, and, 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 and your, in your own research, what, what did you discern between that yeast and bacterial uh, balancing act? You know, I, that, that is the question I think that the sourdough um, enthusiasts, it, it, it's equivalent to the which came first, the beer or the bread. Uh, you know, what, what's more important, the bacteria, the yeast, how stable are they over time? And it's an equally unanswerable question that to do the scientific experiment of controlling all of the variables yeah. um, and, 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 and actually ascertaining what species of bacteria and yeast are present in a starter on day one and how those change over weeks and months and years is prohibitively expensive. And, and to, to change a variable, like let's move my starter from here to San Francisco and see what happens. It, nobody's done the experiment, um, which in some ways is wonderful because it means we can argue about it for another century and, and, uh, yeah. and, still, and still not be able to answer the question. Which is why this is a quest that has no end. It, it has just, it just, it's, it's I, just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'll add into the, uh, for those again who are, were kind of joining us late in the game that that Dr. Michael Gonsley uh, right. early on in this this year's symposium presented on kind of the, some of the foundational principles of the uh, microbiology of sourdoughs. Did you was, did, was he uh, interviewed at all in your book? Did you did you? Uh, I didn't interview him uh, right after I saw his presentation, and I was like, ah, God, I should have missed that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, great. But you covered you know a lot of the same from using other sources. Um, did you have fun? 
writing this oh, book? So much fun, right? So you, you don't write a book unless you're having fun. <laughs> I think it's too much work unless oh, it's fun. Well, there's a certain amount of joy in the in the suffering. <laughs> I think there's joy in the suffering and, and the challenge of trying to get it right. And uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm transforming to the regret of all the things I'm sure I haven't gotten right. Um, but yes, no, it was great. It was great fun. It's great joy. Well, if, if you are finding things that, that you uh, wish you could have a do-over on, that means there could be a sequel in the works. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm sure people are wondering out there, uh, I asked you this earlier, but uh, I, they didn't hear me ask you this, is uh, uh, do you have any thoughts about a, a follow-up? Uh, I, I, I do, and, and my response is sort of twofold is, is uh, I think it depends on whether anybody reads this book, right? So, that, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. right. So, if, if this book turns out to be a book that people will read and and there seems to be interest, yes, I have ideas for buy you buy yourself a copy, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I have ideas for subsequent books um, that that I think really are, are a closer merge between sustainability and 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 how do we make our daily bread better for the planet. Um, uh, which will mean going all the way back to the beginning of, of uh, as you can tell, that's my interest. Like, where do the fertilizers come from to fertilize the wheat that become our daily bread? And and I know enough about that to know that uh, there's some major wars being fought in the world over who's got access to phosphorus, which is the key ingredient. So that uh, would be a, an interesting way to peel the onion back to another level. Yeah. Now you're starting to get into Michael Pollan territory here. It's, exactly. Yeah, right. it's very good. Uh, before we run out of time, a couple more questions, and we'll continue this in the in the uh, after party because a lot of the questions are coming from many of you who who uh, typically join us there. Um, uh, Peyton wants to know how do you cover the history of sourdough, uh, and I, you spelled it the Egyptian, so it's not the, it's A E G I P T I A N the Egyptian times. Um, so again, there I, I hand it to the. Uh, to the really, really brilliant archaeologists who, who, um, who, who can look at archaeological remains and put together, assemble a story that uh, really makes a lot of sense on the evidence that they have un uncovered. So uh, the, the biggest challenge for me is I'm not, a, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm not really a microbiologist and I'm not really a baker, uh, but my goal is to try and put those stories together in ways that perhaps none of those people could could do all you know by themselves yes and, but you are a professor of environmental science and sustainability which i think it's almost like a new it's a new discipline and and right. it fits right in with everything that you're doing so uh so clearly i think uh you know this could be uh, uh this first book could be a seed towards a, a deeper dive on on that the sustainability aspect where, which leads us to fertilizers and everything else so uh, I look forward to that. Let's 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 get a good a good push on the first book so that the publisher. All right, right. That's what I need. Yeah, let's, somebody let's, read the first book and then let's, let's support this guy for another round. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I know that when we, when we uh, before we we went live, you were wondering if we would make it through a whole hour. This hour has flown by. We have just about gobbled it up. And I want to thank you so much for for joining us and sharing this and sharing in a sense the sneak preview of the book that will be out next week. Although well, maybe some of you can get it even today. Some some of the uh, distributors are releasing it early, uh, so maybe the, the printers caught up with the the, the shortage. But uh, congratulations on an, on a great achievement. Uh, I I can vouch for the fact that it's a really good read. This is not a dry academic book. This is a fun journey book. Uh, and look, but you you slip in as a, any good professor will do. You've slipped in a lot of great knowledge and and uh, information and learning in a in an enjoyable, digestible way. So thank you so much for that. And we will definitely continue this conversation in the after party. Uh, I want to thank all of you who are watching uh, for joining us now and those who are watching us on the archive version. Um, uh, just check out Eric's uh, uh, contact info on our, on our uh, dashboard and stay in touch with him and look for the book. It's called, I want to hold it up and give one, one, one final little plug shout out here. There you go. Sourdough culture, a history of bread making from wow. ancient to modern bakers. And really, I think that it's really, if the key word for me is culture. This is really a book about the history of culture told through the lens of sourdough. And I think you did a great job. You got it. Thank you so much, Peter.
All right. And we'll see all of you over in the after party and uh, or next at, at our next session on Wednesday. We'll be with uh, we got Mike, Michael Gleason and Daniel Kurdrak on, on upcycling. So which kind of uh, back. touched on in there. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. We'll see you soon. you to our team behind the scenes. Our event, technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, and Jaydev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. My executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, Communications Director, Melinda Law. Chancellor, Mim Rooney. Charlotte Campus President, Cheryl Richards. And our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all.